me stop sharing. Oh, thank you. And th this call is being recorded. Um, so just to be aware of that as we move forward today. Um, so again, thank you everybody for joining us. I'm Jackie Byam. I'm the acting state conservationist here in South Dakota. Um, I'm here uh, to December 5th, um, and then we're going to be bringing in another acting state conservationist. I, I was under the impression I was hoping I would be here until the, the full time position started, but unfortunately that's not how it's going to work out. I do have good news on the status of the state conservationist selection. Um, so we have worked through the resumes and our scheduling interviews this week and next week. So hopefully we'll have a, a name for you to share or be able to share a name with you on who our next state conservationist in South Dakota is going to be here very shortly. A few updates for you as well. Um, so we do have the update on COVID and staffing. Uh, so we are still in our, our standard COVID, COVID stance, you know, social distancing, masking, everything in the field offices. Um, we did recently get approval to increase our staff size or our staffing at this field office um, going from 50% to 75%. So we do have offices kind of in the, the whole range of things. So if numbers in um, a, a county are, you know, more than one per 10,000, we're going to go down to 25% and then gradually staff back up to 50% and then 75%. So only a handful of counties are under um, the 75% staffing threshold right now, which is good. Like we're, we're moving our way, getting our work done, um, moving forward with that. Staffing, um, we have a lot. We were able to bring on about 30 some direct hires over, this, over the last year during fiscal year 21. Uh, right now, we are currently working on our internal vacancies, some of our higher level positions, uh, and getting those moving through the system. So, ag engineers, um, DCs, program staff, um, positions all across the board. So, we're working on getting those out and pushing those through the system. Uh, we haven't heard if we're going to get a direct hire authority yet for 2022. We did ask for it. Um, so, we want to get these direct hires or these internal vacancies. Uh, filled uh, before this direct hire authority comes out so that we can hopefully promote from within and get the, the higher graded positions filled and then use this direct hire authority to bring in our entry level. Our budget. Um, budget, we received our initial allocation, our advisory allocation on October 1st, uh, and we're looking pretty good for 2022 here in South Dakota. Our budget looks pretty well, uh, able to um, staff up, uh, continue to push through our priorities on that. Uh, we are still working off a continuing resolution until December 3rd. Um, so we are waiting to see what happens with that. So I haven't heard anything recently on the continuing resolution, but right now we're, we're doing pretty good here in South Dakota. Um, did want to share some of our chief's priorities. Uh, Chief Cosby, he was our, um, he's our new chief of NRCS. He did come to us as our state conservationist in Ohio, so he has a really great NRCS background in history with the agency. Really exciting to have him as our chief. Um, so I want to talk to you about some of his priorities. Uh, the first one is ensuring equity and delivery of all NRCS programs and services. Um, basically, we have to make sure that we have equity in everything we do. Um, so right now we're to achieve this equitability in our in our programs and our, our customer service. We're reviewing and modifying um, our program practices and policies uh, that have an impact on our historically underserved producers. Uh, we're going to be increasing training to these producers as well through outreach and our goal um, is to you know make our outreach efforts second to none across all agencies uh, especially within USDA and so you guys as our partners um, are very essential to reaching these HU com communities so we're going to be reaching out working with you all uh, and seeing what we can do to increase our, our customer participation and making sure we are equitable in all of our programs. Uh, so we also have uh, increase in assistance for climate smart agriculture and forestry uh, to producers to increase resiliency. Uh, so drought, storms, fires, etc. You know these are happening very occasional or they're not infrequent anymore. There seems like a, a yearly thing. Uh, anymore, and so they're heavily impacting our producers. Um, so this is going to be a critical component to our work in FY22 uh, and working with our, our landowners and our partners again on, on climate solutions. So internally in NRCS, we're developing an action plan 
uh, on this and we're we're looking forward to that. We do expect it coming out here at the first of the calendar year um, and working through those actions. A third priority is expanding conservation tools and support to urban farmers and communities nationwide. Uh, so right now the, the Farm Bill did create an office, an urban agri office of urban agriculture. Uh, so right now we're building that out. NRCS is the lead that house that is housed under NRCS because of our, our history with working with producers and the, the locally led um, volunteer aspect of our agency. Um, so right now um, we're reviewing policies to adapt to urban and also reviewing and revising our notices of funding opportunities to in, include urban agriculture as well. Um, urban agriculture is not being defined um, by our national office. It's going to be up to the states to determine what is ag urban agriculture in their area. And we'll get into that a little bit later uh, with that when we talk about a new subcommittee that we are developing. Uh, those are the three that have been we've had for the last year, but we did recently add two more priorities, uh, which is cultivating a complete and diverse workforce that has the right tools, science and training. Uh, basically, we need to uphold the scientific integrity of NRCS and build a culture that welcomes, respects and encourages everyone to reach the next level. And our lastly, uh, the fifth priority is to leverage our innovative partnerships um, to get NRCS conservation on our ground. You know, our innovation and partnership, our partnership is what what keeps us going. I'm really wanting to leverage your diversity, um, your innovation uh, to increase our, our capacity in getting conservation on the ground. few more updates that I have. Um, Lake Area Technical College. So I am pleased to announce, share that Lake Area Technical College is the newest college to join the, the C2A3, uh, which is the Community College Alliance for Agriculture Advancement. Um, the C2A3 is a collaboration of Midwest community colleges across nine states who have joined together to provide quality education, training, demonstrations to future farm producers and agricultural service providers. So last week, a few of us uh, from NRCS, we were able to go to Lake Area and tour their farms and campus and start brainstorming ways that we can work together and what our needs are, what our priorities are. Uh, so we're currently working on the, the memorandum of understanding uh, it's in its infancy stage right, this, right now, uh, but we can expect to work with them to host training activities, uh, field demonstrations on locally and regionally important agriculture operations, and working with us to attract, educate, inspire, and prepare students on, in agricultural industries. So I'm really excited to see this partnership grow. I think there's a lot of really great opportunities that are going to be coming out of uh, this agreement, this alliance. Um, so uh, urban agriculture, I, I did mention this earlier as one of the chief priorities. Uh, so one thing that we are doing um, is creating a s urban subcommittee um, for the state technical committee. So as a, as a part of this committee, uh, forming an, a subcommittee for urban agriculture and innovative production. So we are soliciting members interested in participating in this subcommittee. Um, one of those questions is, what does South Dakota urban agriculture look like? Uh, what are the needs, emerging practices, resource concerns, and potential partnering entities to support urban small scale and innovative production? Uh, so we have drafted uh, a definition of urban agriculture, which is the production of, production of agricultural products in um, non-traditional settings, and also a charter for the group to consider as we move forward. Uh, so we would like to have this first subcommittee meeting and coming up in December or January. Uh, so if you are interested in participating in that subcommittee group, please let me know. Um, I will be sending out an email after this meeting as well, um, letting you know that if you are interested to please um, send an email back to me uh, by the end of the month, by November 30th, I believe is the date I'm going to put on that. And so that is my quick update on state conservationist activities been going on. Uh, so before we go into the agenda, are there any questions? All right, hearing, uh, hearing none, uh, we'll go on to the next agenda item, which is the congressional representatives. Um, so I did see, I do believe um, we did have a representative from S Senator Rounds' office. Yep, Jim yep. Salter Sorry. here in Rapid City. Good morning, Jim. Do you have any updates or anything you want to share with the group today? Um, um, 
I'm sure most of you have, are aware that uh, Mike's wife, Jean, passed away here recently. So he's been busy with family matters, um, but he is back in DC this week working full time. So. All right, condolences to, to Senator Rounds and his family uh, on the I passing. Will, of the I will family. let Mike know. Thank you. That's really all I have unless there's any questions of me. All right, thank you, Jim. Um, Senator Thune's office, do we have a, a representative from Senator Thune's on the line? All right, how about um, Representative Johnson? All right, thank you again, Jim, for, for joining us today. We do appreciate you being on with us. Um, with that, we're going to move on with the agenda, um, going on to Farm Service Agency updates uh, with Joe Schultz and Owen Fagerhaug. Um, Joseph and Owen, over to you. Hey, thanks, Jackie. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Joe Schultz. I'm the Acting State Executive Director for South Dakota Farm Service Agency and sure appreciate being invited into this meeting. Um, don't have a lot for you, but I would start off, you know, it's been a it's been a good year in that getting a lot of things done. CRP has been active. I'm sure Owen will touch on those things, ECP. So I want to express, you know, my appreciation for the cooperation and assistance and the teamwork that we've had with all the all of our partners, uh, NRCS, Pheasants Forever and and on and on. I mean, a lot of challenges, but a lot of good work done. And and thank you all. Uh, looking forward. Now let's look at the present for a second. You know, um, in this role over the past several months and before that, in 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 her own capacity, you know, Jamie White as our uh, state executive officer was also filling in as the acting state executive director. Well, just this past week, uh, Jamie announced that she has accepted a position in the national office as the um, assistant to the deputy administrator for the farm programs. So did South Dakota FSA lose a lot of talent? Yes and no, because she's still with FSA and, and um, you know, she's got a lot of big work ahead of her. Some of that big work ahead of her was included in the legislation with the continuing resolution. There was a lot of funding for some disaster programs. And so, yeah, we got air, our regular business going on. Yes, we do. But um, coming mostly after the first of the year, it's going to be some substantial um, disaster programs to assist with uh, some of the losses on the 2021 drought. And of course, the hurricanes and the floods and the wildfires, but for South Dakota, uh, primarily looking at the drought and some wildfire perhaps. So uh, beyond that, uh, take any questions. Thanks for the invite. I'm going to pass it forward to Owen Fagerhog and let him have the floor. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Uh, just a few things. Um, the first thing I want to touch on is just an update on some activity that the CRP subcommittee through the state tech committee acted on between meetings. Uh, and that item is the uh, review of the conservation priority area that is identified um, and used for our general CRP signups. Try to share the map here quick. Maybe. Um, can we see the map? No? Yes? Um, yes, now we can. All right. So this is the, the resulting area. It didn't change a lot from the prior year. Uh, we were able to include some additional acres based on the new math or updated math on the 25% of the state cropland. So the area in the yellow would be our state CPA. So that's the qualifying area for general CRP signup west of the river. 
the the hash marks which includes the yellow and the counties identified east of the river get additional points for water and wildlife quality points towards the general sign up and then just a reminder that all of east river qualifies in the national conservation priority area so automatically eligible based on the prairie pothole region eligibility for general sign up uh, so we had uh, a group come together um, reviewed that submitted it for national office review and uh, have not heard that it was not approved so assuming we'll go forward here with this new area for the general sign up starting in fiscal year 22. Uh, past years sign up successes uh, we had a total of 481,598 acres or 89 acres approved uh, under the sign up for fiscal year 21. Uh, that resulted in 98,931 of continuous sign up acreages, which is all encompassing. We'd have CREP sign up within that. Uh, we'd have the FWP, the regular continuous, and uh, Clear 30, which is a new practice uh, that was announced with the 2018 Farm Bill. General sign up uh, 12,216. I think that press release had went out previously this year, so you folks are probably aware of that. Grassland sign up consisted of 370,235 acres, so one of our larger sign ups within the, the fiscal year 21. And then our ship sign up, the Soil Health Income Protection Program. Um, it's again just a reminder that consists of only five states identified within the prairie pothole region uh, we had a total of 166 acres get approved under that this last year so not a real big number but again that can only be on 15 percent of the least productive ground on a farm and uh, it's a three to five year contract so uh, that's the interest we had in that and uh, Kind of where we landed but all total all signups inclusive 481,589 for fiscal year 21. Uh, that's just kind of a quick update on where we stand conservation wise with south dakota and i guess i would field any questions if there are some george yeah um, hand is real, yeah thank you um i got lost in the numbers a little bit of that uh, approximately 400,000 acres of new crp how much of that is grassland CRP? So I, I guess my question is how much is what I'm gonna call traditional CRP? Uh, the number for the grasslands, the working lands program was 370,235. So you'd have to take that away from the 481 and then the balance would be the... Okay, 481 is the total. And then how much in the grassland? 370,000. 370,000. Yeah. So the traditional CRP then, if I get my high school math here, is about 110,000. That's new acres. Okay. Math, yeah, 111. 111,000. Yeah. Okay. Um, how many acres came out? Where are we at in South Dakota for total? And I'm going to call it again, oh. traditional CRP acres. Yeah, let me jump over here quick. I think I had a spreadsheet that could identify that quickly. Maybe. So in 21, it's just pulling up here. In 2021, we had a total of 110,456 acres expired. So we basically replaced it with our traditional CRP. Okay. And so where does that leave us total wise in the state for CRP? Uh, I think I run some numbers earlier this month and we're about 1.7 million. But that, all includes, but that includes the grassland. That's correct. Yep. That's okay, all. Now, if you take out the grassland, where are we at with, with CRP? Uh, I don't know if I have the grasslands broke down for all signups, but I can sure get that figure for you, George. Yeah, I'd be, be curious to see what that is. So. I'm assuming it's going to be right around that million, 900,000 to a million acres, if I recollect where we were at with grasslands previously. So we're kind of holding steady then on CRP at just under a million acres. I would agree with that, yes. We're doing okay. well. 
All right. Are you going to talk at all about the emergency hang and grazing that occurred this year? I uh, I can, I guess. I didn't have it on my agenda item, but I would field any questions on that if you had something to need clarified. I, I guess I'm just curious what the rules were as far as how much could be uh, hayed, um, how many producers took advantage of it, how many acres did we actually see um, hayed this year, and um, uh, I guess uh, were the mowing dates uh, did they did were they uh, did they stick by the mowing dates of I think it was August second uh, uh, did they were they able to do whole fields were they able to do strips again I I didn't I, I apologize because I don't know no nope, that's fine I'll just give you the high level overview real quickly um, 2018 Farm Bill expanded our authorizations for haying and grazing opportunities on a wholesale basis for CRP. Uh, number one, contracts previously approved could exercise once out of every three years at no more than 75% of the acreage, and they pay a 25% payment reduction on that activity. So that's normal non-emergency haying opportunities that all contracts previously approved would be eligible for. They can meet the frequency, they can hay up to 75%. The emergency provisions expanded that if a county is designated in an emergency, a, a D2 status or greater, D2 for eight weeks or a D3, now I shouldn't say that, a D2 status, they, they are automatically eligible for 100% of the acreage, irregardless of what happened in a prior year. If the county's drought severity increased to a level that qualified them for a livestock feed program payment through FSA, so the LFP payments, which is a separate and distinct program from CRP, that county's designation then fell to only 50% of the acreage on eight eligible practices. And those eight eligible practices cons consisted of the previously approved prior farm bill uh, managed haying practices. So your upland practices, your ones, twos, four Ds, uh, 18Bs, 18Cs, and then the safe practices. So even though counties qualified for emergency and based on the, the designation of the LFP eligibility, we had quite a number of producers that elected based on their frequency and availability to pay the 25% reduction and pay up to the 75%, just because it got them more acres available for production in a drought year. Um, the total, the statistics that you referenced or asked about on total producers that have, that participated in it and that, uh, we do have a, a report due here in December, so we don't have those compiled yet as a state. Counties are currently reporting that to us. Uh, but I would say um, there was a number of producers that exercised the, the opportunity and hate the acreage. Um, did I did I answer them all, George? I just want to make sure I kind of got you what you needed there. I, I think so. I guess uh, I, I would hope that report is made available to us once you get. I always yeah. think it's good to look at what we did um, yep. and, and be able to document that. Um, Absolutely. I guess I don't have any other questions. If something comes up, I'll pop up again. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's what I had, Jackie, so I'll turn it back to you. All right, thank you very much. Next up on the agenda, we have a soil health update with Kent. Okay, am I coming through loud and clear? Yes, you are. Okay, thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, good to be with you all again. Um, another uh, windy South Dakota day. So I'm going to change things up a little bit today. Um, we're going to take a break from the, the soil health principles and um, kind of my no-till doesn't work series. And we're going to go through um, something that I think is very exciting. Um, and hopefully after uh, after my talk today, um, many of you have um, some ideas to bring forward and, um, and contribute to uh, Kind of to a new project that's uh, just getting off the ground here. So let me share my screen real quick.
Okay, so um, what I'm going to talk about today is um, the new project um, that's um, through the Beetle Conservation District and in association with uh, Ducks Unlimited also. So um, it's called the Dale Demonstration Farm. Um, and uh, while, the, while the title may not seem like, like much, um, hopefully the, this presentation will get you excited about uh, the opportunity that this uh, new demonstration farm is going to present us all. Um, so as most of you are aware, I, I spend a chunk of uh, my, my working hours doing uh, soil health demonstrations for various groups and at different events. Um, and I, and I, I really enjoy that part of my job. Um, but previously, I, I worked in the field office and um, was able to you know, organize field days and field events and participate in a lot of those. And so uh, that's kind of kind of where my heart lies. Um, so if you'll look at the background here, you'll see, you know, some of the traditional demonstrations that you'll you'll often see myself and others like me do. So, you know, you'll see the middle screen is the the, the all popular rainfall simulation, um, which is um, pretty well distributed throughout the state, and a lot of people have seen it. Um, and you also notice that there's a picture of a soil clod, and then there's also on, on the one other side of the screen, that clod sitting in uh, in the tube of water, the, the slake test. And so these are all demonstrations that we perform in front of various groups and at events. And, you know, they're very effective at showing um, what happens to our soil based off of different management types. And, you know, they're very educational. Um, I like to think that they, they change hearts and minds with producers and landowners that, you um, we're showing these demonstrations, but you know, even if they do change a producer or landowners, if they change their heart and mind that they are going to uh, adopt some soil health principles on their operation, they're they're still kind of left with a with a now what? You know, where do I start? Where do I get the information? How can I find out um, what I should be doing as far as it relates to each one of the, the five soil health principles? Um, who do I contact? Where do I find these uh, principles being demonstrated or actually being applied on the land? Well, now we've got um, hopefully this demonstration farm that we can we can point them to. So here's some ways that we, in my mind, that we more effectively demonstrate soil health principles. And I'm just going to go through a few slides here for the sake of time. I'm not going to spend a lot of uh, a lot of time and effort on each slide. But so this is agronomically. How do we demonstrate soil health? We've got uh, some equipment in the background and we've got some results uh, in, the, in the other slide or in the other picture. <clears throat> so, you know, when we say specifically uh, soil health practices on cropland, um, there's a lot that we all know, a lot of variables, a lot of things that a producer needs to think about if they're going to adopt um, the various principles of soil health on their cropland. So that involves equipment, that involves seed and seeding methods that involves uh, fertilizer and fertility application. Um, it involves lots of different things that are traditional agronomy. And so if we can more effectively demonstrate this on the ground, it's a better way for a producer to, to learn these soil health principles. Okay, another way we can demonstrate soil health principles, um, and this is one that's kind of near and dear to my heart, is, uh, is through livestock on, on cropland and the importance of that. But, you know, it's easy for us to say as, as technical specialists and conservationists, you know, you should really have some livestock on your cropland. Okay, now what? How does the producer actually implement that? Um, what are the species of cover crop, for example, that they may be interested in or that would work for their operation? How do they manage the livestock on that land? Do they just turn them loose and make sure they're fenced in and have water provided or do they manage it more a little more intensively what are their goals um, and then you also see that there's a, the next slide and it's just a, a fence line view of more traditional uh, native pasture land how do we manage that we've got uh, a lot of experience with our agency and in, in showing and working with producers on grazing plans but oftentimes it's more effective that we can show them different management types Okay, how do we also how do we demonstrate and how do we show how to manage these very specific resource concerns? And so you, here you'll see a couple of photos of, of saline and sodic areas um, that are 
really prevalent throughout the James River Valley and in other areas throughout the state also. How do we show how to effectively manage these areas? How do we show how to bring them back into, um, in some cases, traditional row crop production? How in other cases do we show how to maybe change land use and still leave that as production acres and still make them profitable? Um, here's some things that sometimes we don't think about if we're not necessarily wildlife focused. And this is where um, some of my coworkers will often give me a hard time where I, I, I really kind of say that if you're adopting the five soil health principles, you can solve just about anything in a resource concern or you can meet any interest group's needs. And this is uh, just a photo of a field in um, Southern Beetle County and it's of small grains. And then you'll notice that there's on the photo towards the bottom corner that there is some <clears throat> waterfowl that's been nesting in there and so this is not the producer's goal or the landowner's goal to increase wildlife habitat but it's more of a side benefit of the principles they've adopted okay and this is um what i'm glad we included this in the slide deck for today because it's um, a little bit uh, on the more non-traditional side of agriculture for south dakota um you know and i, I think as an agency we're calling it urban agriculture um, in South Dakota, I, we're going to have to probably come up with a different or better definition for it because we don't have traditionally a lot of urban area in South Dakota. We do have urban areas, um, but we have a lot of non-traditional uh, agriculture that's starting to take place in South Dakota. We have fruit and vegetable production that's taking place on smaller acreages. Uh, we have vineyards and orchards that are being um, implemented and grown throughout the state. And so these are types of production that a lot of us aren't necessarily as as familiar with, um, but they're certainly becoming uh, more popular, especially as uh, you know land prices are high. And so if you don't have the cash flow to purchase 2000 acres and you're looking to get into production agriculture, you can purchase five acres probably and make a pretty good living off of that in non-traditional production. So how do we demonstrate these areas? Okay, this is another thing where um, this is probably along the urban side, but it's, um, you know, sometimes we we talk about talk a lot about, for example, pollinators and um, native plants and how beneficial they are to uh, to the landscape and to to our world as a whole. But how do we really implement those? Can we imp implement those on a smaller scale in someone's front yard? Um, do we have technical background in, in order to be able to help them do that? Um, if we can find areas or an area where we can demonstrate this so people can come and look. Um, that's more effective than uh, someone like myself talking to them blue in the, in the face with someone about this is good and you should do it. Okay, and then what I'm trying to get across with these slides here is that it's it's important to demonstrate these areas. And it's important to get uh, research and data collected on these areas. So how do we draw in um, some of our some of our coworkers and um, some of our partners that are in the in the research or the extension side of things. Um, you know, oftentimes they do they have their research plots. Um, we have specific research farms around the state. Um, Beersford would be an example. Um, Dakota Lakes would be another. Um, and they're great. They demonstrate a lot of different things as far as crop rotation and fertility management and tillage management, um, sometimes on a smaller scale and smaller plots. How do we demonstrate that on a larger scale that's more scalable to a producer that says, um, you know, that's great, you did that on a, on a 20 by 50 plot, but how do I implement that on a thousand acres? Um, well, hopefully we're, we're working towards that now. And so uh, Ducks Unlimited and Beetle Conservation District had, had a pretty good vision of uh, we maybe need to find a larger scale area that we can demonstrate this, um, these conservation practices and soil health principles. And so uh, Ducks Unlimited was able to obtain land and then um, uh, make a long story short to basically they worked it out. So it's um, now part of Beetle Conservation District and there's a management team that will um, help, help make decisions on what takes place. And so this is the piece of ground. It's approximately 300 acres. Um, south of here on South Dakota, um, actually not very far from town, just about three, four miles south of town. And it's been in um, <clears throat> crop production and production agriculture for, for decades upon decades. And 
I'm going to show you this is something interesting that one of my coworkers found uh, black and white imagery from I believe 1952. And so what I'd like to point out on this is I've highlighted with just different color polygons here is there was various land uses that we were able to figure out that happened on this piece of ground in that year. Um, actually, the producer has since passed, but his son we were able to go back and actually his dad kept a production history on this and what took place. And so you'll notice that this 300 acres was divided into several different land uses. So we've got grass hay in the northwest. There was pasture in the southwest and then there was an alfalfa field there was small grain wheat another alfalfa field and there was a bigger larger area of production flax and then there was grass hay in the southeast corner with some more alfalfa um it kind of bordered a, a pothole wetland there so it's it's interesting that there's many land uses that this producer had this 300 acres divided into and this is something we don't see very much anymore is 300 acres divided up into several different land uses um, but, but really this producer, they, they knew what they were doing. They had basically fit the production to what the land was saying was best um, for profit on these acres. And so here's more of what this piece of land looked like uh, prior to, um, well, four or five years ago. So it's all basically in row crop production. You can see there's just uh, some really identifiable resource concerns. You can see some saline sodic areas. Um, you can see some, <clears throat> Uh, seasonal and temporary wetlands that oftentimes don't get planted and if they do get planted they oftentimes drown out with a large rainfall event. Um, really there's uh, many resource concerns that need to be to be addressed. Uh, this is a picture of uh, this is after uh, Ducks Unlimited had obtained it had obtained it and this is after a couple of years. I believe this is actually uh, 2020 imagery if I am remembering correct. So you'll notice that it's very much like uh, a lot of croplands, uh, cropland fields that we see throughout the prairie pothole region of the <clears throat> northern plains here. There's really productive soil. There's a lot of, um, there's a hudic and hand loams that are out there. There's also some Dudley Tatanka complex, which is a little lower lying and tends to be prone to flooding. And it can be productive, but it's oftentimes um, too wet to, to crop. Okay, so there's a new plan with these acres and it's kind of just getting off and rolling. Um, but basically the, the goal is to adopt all five principles on, on this ground and to, to demonstrate practices, sometimes innovative, sometimes older practices that we're kind of resurrecting. Um, but we're trying to turn this into an area that is very accessible for producers to show up at any time and even at organized events, um, which hopefully will take place at a regular basis. Um, but this is uh, something that we're not trying to necessarily reinvent the wheel. You know, there's there's other demonstration sites um, here, especially in the Northern Plains. There's Dakota Lakes out by Pier, um, which has been, been very instrumental in the adoption of no-till techniques. Um, there's Minokin Farm out by Bismarck, which is um, along the lines of adopting soil health principles. And so we're not, re uh, we're not reinventing the wheel, but we are going to hopefully make the wheel a little bit different in how we're um, presenting these um, soil health principles. And so it'll be everything, um, it'll be operated by a producer. Um, so it won't be operated actually by Ducks Unlimited or the Conservation District, but they will lease it to a producer and they will um, be Im implementing a lot of these practices. So it's very real world. We'll be collecting soil data, we'll be collecting production data, economic data. Um, all of this will be available um, eventually to producers um, and hopefully make it very, uh, very easy for them to to contact um, someone related with this farm if they have questions or they can show up any particular day and hopefully just get a one on one tour sometimes or they can show up at organized events. So um, this may have seemed uh, kind of like a promotional video and um, that's probably because it was. It's um, something I, I'm very passionate about and a lot of members that have taken <clears throat> part in getting this up and running um, are also passionate about too. So. Uh, with that, so I'll have something for everyone. Um, hopefully we're able to prove that here um, with this Dale demonstration farm. So with that, are there any questions or comments? Um, if you think of something later, certainly shoot me an email or give me a ring. So thank you very much for your time, everyone. Um, Jackie, back to you.
All right, thank you for that. That was very interesting. Uh, looking forward to seeing what that demonstration site comes up with. Lots of really good work going on out there. Uh, so any questions for Kent regarding what we just covered? All right, not seeing any in the chat either, so we're going to move along. Uh, so next up we have the woody species encroachment, and I'm going to ask Jeff VW to introduce our next speaker. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, just wanted to take a, a minute here to introduce Dirac Tidwell. Um, he's a uh, professor down at UNL, uh, and I got to work with him slash meet him while I was acting down in Nebraska. And I thought I would just mention the fact that um, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, and South Dakota have all entered into an agreement um, to work on woody species encroachment. And, and Dr. Tidwell is basically our, our science advisor, and he's kind of the guy that's helping us determine, you know, kind of some of the best approaches that we can use to help kind of combat this uh, woody species encroachment that we've got going on. Uh, obviously, it's, well, it's not new to the state, but we don't have a major problem yet. But I think um, what you'll see is that, you know, we're kind of on that cusp of, of having an opportunity to control it versus, you know, having having a situation that kind of gets out of hand. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Tidwell and he'll kind of update us on uh, the woody species encroachment effort. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I'll probably go ahead and uh, turn off my video once we get going here a little bit too. It's uh, a little slow today for me here in, uh, in Nebraska. But yeah, thanks everybody uh, and allowing me to share some information for today's state technical committee uh, meeting. Um, it's something that uh, seems to be a pretty regular feature now. It's uh, We've done this for uh, every state as part of that four state agreement and we're really seeing a lot of progress in this area. So I'm gonna share a few things with you here so that we can uh, dive a little deeper into uh, why this is becoming such a big issue and why it's, we're addressing it this way. So this four state agreement really started uh, as a result of the state conservationists from South Dakota to Oklahoma coming together, uh, seeing some of the, the, the data and information technology we have, and just understanding how big of a issue and resource concern that, uh, that is happening and how that's gonna amplify in the central Great Plains in now and into the next couple decades, especially. So, I think that's one of our grand challenges that we have that you're gonna hear me communicate about today, that uh, resource concerns aren't just how you look at your feet or uh, how we, you know, traditionally in rangelands, we, we often took pictures or trained people in universities of looking at, our at the ground. Uh, what you're talking about now are biome scale, uh, state transitions, biome scale threats, biome scale resource concerns. And that's something that is unprecedented you know, in terms of modern conservation uh, profession and, and challenges that we have on private lands. So woody encroachment is one of those big biome scale threats that really across grasslands all, all over the world is being increasingly recognized as a biome scale issue. And we just don't have a lot of examples of large scale success. And so what we're doing is actually creating a science-based strategy so that we can solve this at large scales. So I'll, I'll walk you through some of what we know and how that works. All right, so this is what, this is what I used to uh, do in terms of building awareness on this issue a couple years ago. I mean, we just didn't have the kind of technology and data that's now emerged in rangelands. And so what we talked about is that really what's playing out this century that is a big concern is that it's not just about, you know, state transition models or what, you know, oftentimes we put in our ecological site descriptions and, and we view that at, at a, a scale that matches how we've been trained or how we see our system. What's happening now is that those transitions are scaling up to unprecedented levels. So they might start smaller and they scale up to be regional or biome levels. And examples of that that you hear today are these like coral reef collapses where they go from a productive coral reef to this unproductive state. And it's not just patches of coral reef anymore. We're talking about wholesale coral reef collapse. The same is true all over the world. We're talking about regional scale collapse of grasslands, 
transitioning to woody dominated systems. And of course, in the Great Plains, we have one of those historical and rare examples associated with things like the Dust Bowl. So the point of all this, right, is that large scale transitions, they lead to completely unexpected, surprising consequences that go beyond our own profession. They affect everything in our society. And that's why we want to prevent them at all costs. It's it's really incredibly difficult to try and prevent large scale transitions given momentum in nature today, and also to reverse them when they occur. Uh, and that's just simply because of the geographic extent of these kind of changes and how impactful they are. So we hypothesize in general in the science that some of the most catastrophic changes that we expect are large scale transitions or ones that transcend scale. So think about it like uh, it's, if you have encroachment coming from a windbreak, right? Like that's a very low scale or fine scale type of transition threat. But if that repeats itself over many different counties and many different areas, what you actually see is something that can transcend scale and you're talking about eco-region or multi-state type of collapse. And that's where it's so important to not just be ambulance drivers saying, oh, I see a problem here, let's fix it. We've got to do this more preventative approach to conservation if we're going to deal with those threats. Well, what's turned in the last couple of years is like an awareness campaign to where we've been able to make this more real. And we're seeing uh, the NRCS really respond in this. I was a lead architect for what's the first ever biome scale framework for conservation action uh, for the NRCS in America's grasslands. So if you're looking at this, think about like since the Dust Bowl, since a lot of CRP work, what you're looking at is the biggest conservation movement for grasslands since that history. And if done right, it should be the biggest one that's ever been implemented. So there's a lot of different efforts and partnerships uh, associated with the NRCS, but this is our first ever one that's uh, that's meant to deal with biome scale threats. It also takes a private lands approach that matches the sagebrush uh, biome and their efforts with the sage grouse initiative. So it takes some of that lessons learned and success, but applies private lands uh, principles to it. Now, it's no wonder that this is happening. We're talking about 3 billion birds since 1990 and a lot of stuff coming out uh, in the journal Science and other top end journals. But we also can start to track one of our most important metrics for the first time in rangelands, and that's the impact to the beef industry. So you can combine this agricultural industry with uh, a lot of the kind of wildlife type of conservation. And often that's been difficult in the Great Plains. It's often that those are at ends with each other. Not for woody encroachment, these go hand in hand. So there's a huge opportunity if we recognize what's happening to get out in front of this. Now, I mentioned a couple slides ago that uh, we just didn't have the kind of information to do more of this like generality based awareness campaign. And I really feel like this approach with this four state initiative, um, I'm also a, a core member of the Working Lands for Wildlife Science team. And uh, what we're doing is actually creating this highly rapid integrated approach to help uh, with implementation and the generation of outcomes in the Great Plains. So quickly, if you see things like these frameworks that are coming out, these frameworks provide a program neutral umbrella to be able to take some of the strategies that we've learned in the science and apply them under a banner of something like the NRCS. And that informs our technology that's needed. And so the rangeland analysis platform has a number of additional products that we're generating uh, in order to be able to deliver upon uh, the promises and strategies in those frameworks. And that technology helps guide implementation. And so you're seeing this Great Plains Grasslands Initiative or GPGI uh, launched in Kansas last year. Nebraska just uh, did trainings and released their launch earlier this year for uh, this fiscal year. Oklahoma, we're starting the launch for GPGI um, December uh, 6th and 7th. And we're having this discussion now in South Dakota. This is our implementation, right? Every state is saying, hey, GPGI is how we start to think about large scale grassland conservation to biome scale threats. And that's every state is kind of putting under that umbrella of branding which shows a really unique thing in rangelands. We haven't had that kind of common implementation messaging and umbrella and talking points. But of course, we wanna know what those outcomes are. We don't wanna just generate acres uh, treated, dollars spent, right? That's not benefiting uh, ecosystems unless we can measure it. 
So we have, again, these measurable outcomes that you're going to see on the back end. And those outcomes drive changes in adaptation or strategy. As we learn more, we actually adjust our frameworks and strategy associated with that. And I've just never been part of a team that's done this so quickly. And I think that's what's great and why we're having this conversation in South Dakota. So I'll jump right into it. Uh, there's two biome scale threats in the Great Plains. So uh, these are, and these are associated with state transitions happening at large scales. And in the Northern Great Plains, or in the Northern half, most people know about land use conversion and how much is, that's been taken out over the years. And uh, the interesting part of it is that woody encroachment, which is much slower technically, right? It takes a long time for that to ramp up, is now converting land at the same rate as land use conversion. So if we're not paying attention to this double whammy, right? If it's not the tractor, it's the trees, uh, we're getting a lot of, uh, of grassland that's being taken out of production uh, or that's being uh, lost in terms of wildlife habitat. And of course, it's one of the most uh, endangered ecosystems on the planet. Uh, there's less of our grasslands remaining than there is tropical rainforests and greater amounts of conversion. So if you look at this, look at this double whammy, right? Like, Everywhere that hasn't been cultivated, all these areas with low cultivation risk, you're seeing here in green. So huge chunks of South Dakota, the Sand Hills of Nebraska, the Flint Hills of Kansas, the Gypsum Hills or Red Hills of Kansas and Oklahoma. You're seeing these huge amounts of low cultivation risk. And those are some of our biggest source areas uh, that continue to exist at large scales. But look at the warning that's happening in the Great Plains. Like if, if they haven't been cultivated yet, everywhere of low cultivation risk is getting hammered and has tree encroachment happening on it. And I'll show you some additional information on what that starts to look like over time. Uh, so it's really the combination of these maps that we wanna start getting people to think about. And it's easy to see land use conversion because it happens overnight, right? And we, we kind of get normalized to woody encroachment. It's kind of like my wife keeps telling me my garage is cluttered and I got used to it and don't notice, right? But it is. Uh, same thing with woody encroachment. We get normalized to it until we start feeling the true impacts as it continues to ramp up. And that's what it looks like in combination. So you start taking this picture, everywhere purple has been plowed, has some encroachment, or you're talking about forested area. Uh, everywhere yellow are these areas that are giving signals that they're at risk uh, to the near term um, to woody encroachment or they're at higher risk for uh, cultivation. And the green are these more intact cores. So you start looking at this overall, the state of our biome is in great threat. Uh, so we have to deal with biome scale threats first if we're going to have our so much of our other investments matter long term, right? Like a, a lot of the conversation in Nebraska is our investments in fencing, our investments in water and other things associated with cattle. Well, what happens if woody encroachment then takes that land out of agricultural production like it did in areas of, say, Texas? Those investments are at risk if we don't deal with biome scale threats. So we wanna have an eye to both of those going forward. Now this is new. We just couldn't track this until a couple of years ago. A good friend and colleague of mine at University of Montana developed the rangeland analysis platform and allows us to see functional groups that drive state transitions for every baseball field for the entire Western US and it's being expanded. Uh, this allows me to see do we have large scale bare ground problems, large scale woody, large scale annuals, large scale shrubs? Like what's changing in our system? And for our system, it's it's woody encroachment. Uh, and I think what's so impressive in watching this is just as we've given this information out on this framework, the NRCS leadership really responded quickly overnight. Uh, we're talking about 10 million acres overnight being committed uh, in the Great Plains to dealing with these biome scale threats before we've been able to really train up on this. Interestingly, maybe not surprising, 92% of that commitment comes from Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, and South Dakota. So you're seeing this four state initiative really being able to put a bullseye on how we address this issue and how we solve it and our commitment to it. So I wanna point out a big uh, release. I've got a link to this at the end, but the first, big benchmark or goal as part of this four state initiative was uh, I was tasked with really developing a, a science-based strategy to help solve the problem. As all ecologists, we did a really good job of talking about consequences, mechanisms, 
but we didn't have solutions necessarily for you. And now we we really strongly have that. Uh, this has uh, this has commitments or representation from nearly every land grant institution in the Great Plains. For rangelands, that's incredibly rare. We're talking about an entire uh, umbrella of commitments, an entire umbrella of, of shared vision that this is our better approach to dealing with woody encroachment. And we're, if we're gonna win, we have to reduce risk and understand what makes them vulnerable to get ahead of it. So this guide is, is really the result of this four state initiative and really puts our best management practices going forward. And uh, part of what we're going to do as a group in terms of training up on this and understanding how we just can better win, especially in places like South Dakota. Nobody's acted so quickly, but if we don't look at managing risk and vulnerability, I already know what's gonna happen in South Dakota. We've been studying this in Nebraska, Kansas, and Texas uh, for decades. It's clear what's coming. If we're gonna get ahead, we have to apply those lessons learned from those other states. And this is what this looks like. So let me show you a little bit of the data on this. This is what our biome looked like in 2000. So this is the Western boundary of the Great Plains where you see all those kind of red patches where the traditional forests start popping. You can see the Black Hills of South Dakota, uh, the Pine Ridge of Northwestern Nebraska, the Halsey National Forest in the middle of the Sand Hills. And you can see this Eastern boundary. That Eastern boundary looks more like Halsey National Forest uh, when you go east of there than it does like our past grasslands. And watch what happens over 20 years. We're talking about biomes here. In 20 years, you are seeing the shrinking or collapse of our biome. We are living it. No group's ever lived through this scale of biome collapse that wasn't an intentional land use conversion. So this is a huge amount of change playing out. And you're seeing that warning signal manifest through South Dakota and even Eastern North Dakota. And we can actually, we have this publicly available on the wrap. You can see these, uh, where things are playing out across different areas of South Dakota, these early warning signals of large scale transitions. The Flint Hills of Kansas burns 2 million acres a year and they barely made this biome scale signal flinch. We just do not have our controls and treatments in place to deal with this scale of a resource concern. Uh, and that's the point of these conversations. I mean, good grief, we spent $177 million in the last farm bill. We spent it in the red chasing this problem and it got worse over time. We have to get ahead of this if we're going to conserve our largest big grasslands that are left. And that's part of our effort and initiative here. Now, maybe you don't care about that uh, from, a, from a working lands or beef production or just our biome standpoint. What we're showing you is this generalized system early warning signal. So this is a paper coming out in ecological applications from my lab uh, by Caleb Roberts. And what you're seeing is in Kansas, we were showing how greater prairie chickens they have reduced safe operating space or their usable habitat is becoming increasingly close to where then they will totally abandon the sites. So as you're seeing this signal, we're giving you long-term abilities to get ahead of this and deal with these types of transitions because our wildlife, our ecosystem services depend on it. And that's what we now have for the first time. You can see how this is playing out and we can avoid some of the denialism that really challenged us in states south of here. Another product that we have coming out is this uh, is showing you from a biological standpoint, what's at risk. So everywhere green on this map is what is our best modeled estimate of what's truly intact and is not contaminated by the source of the problem, which is seed from encroaching woody species. Everywhere that's yellow is within two football fields of a seed source. There was new data out of Nebraska that we were able to generate that showed 95% of recruitment into our intact grasslands was within two football fields of a seed source. So those individual mature plants, right? By letting them persist on the landscape, it's the biological mechanism for encroachment. So what do we do? We wait until there's a sufficient amount of cover, then we treat it. But what happens? It's full of seed. It has that seed bank still there. So it comes back and then we have to treat it again. The horror story, and they call it a joke, but it's definitely not so funny, is that while I was doing research in Texas, ranchers were increasingly saying that they've sold the ranch three times to, play, to pay for brush management. That's how it starts to feel. Well, that's a result of our guidance. And that guidance comes from the science. We missed the biological mechanism that's so important here, which is that there's so much seed produced in these areas 
We're not managing the exposure to the problem. That's why the Flint Hills isn't uh, working even better. They have more and more area that's just close proximity to seed sources. So they now have to have a really high maintenance grassland to keep up with it. If we keep these big areas intact, we can manage low maintenance grasslands, which is great. That's what we wanna do in South Dakota. But all these yellow areas, we're telling you that they're increasingly becoming higher maintenance grasslands. So the producer investment is gonna have to go up to prevent it from turning red, which is our more mature woody encroachment sites. And this doesn't, this isn't just something of where our vulnerability and risk is playing out, this means something. So we have data showing how much is being lost to agricultural productivity uh, or rangeland productivity. We lost 170,000 tons due to woody encroachment in 2019 in South Dakota. So if we're not calling it a problem yet, I'm sure that we start showing this to our representatives, the agricultural sector, like our uh, South Dakota cattlemen's. I don't think we want to, we can afford losing 170,000 tons or more of rangeland productivity from our beef system and that beef sector. And this is only going to go up because guess what? Nebraska used to look like South Dakota. And we've now lost 530,000 tons of productivity in 2019. And one of the most intact true prairies in the world, the Sand Hills, is now dealing with it at unprecedented scale. And when I moved here in 2013, they said, we do not have a woody encroachment problem in the Sand Hills. And I said, well, that's an interesting hypothesis. Look what it looks like now. There's a ton of that area that is no longer intact, and we now have to figure out how to deal with that. And of course, Kansas used to look like Nebraska. Kansas lost 2 million tons of productivity in 2019. And look at that Flint Hills area. Even though that's a, the last remaining tall grass prairie region in the world, you're talking about very little that doesn't have close proximity to seed sources. And Doug Spencer in Kansas actually went through there. These green areas actually have individual trees across most of them that isn't picked up by satellite technology. So it's not even as good as what it looks like on here. There's a whole lot of yellow, which means there's grasslands largely intact, but that are at risk. How do we get ahead of those issues across this state? And that's why Kansas acted immediately. And of course, Oklahoma used to look like Kansas. They lost 7 million tons of productivity in 2019, and it leaves them with maybe five core areas left. And in Oklahoma, Professor Dave, Dr. Dave Ingle in the 90s was saying, this is our biome's biggest threat. So this is the future of Nebraska, it's future of South Dakota. It, it's a huge issue. Woody encroachment and things like Eastern Red Cedar take land out of agricultural production. And it takes land out of wildlife habitat, and it results in increased wildfire danger, issues with water. Uh, we've tracked it with school funding here in Nebraska, and we're going to do a study that expands on it. It affects every citizen in our state in weird ways because our biome is collapsing. New data shows stuff associated with increased West Nile virus is uh, tied to eastern red cedar habitats more than deciduous and grassland habitats. There's increased in lodestar tick disease expansion associated with this. So South Dakota has the opportunity that no other state has had, and that is to be the first state that commits to getting ahead of a biome scale threat and dealing with this uh, and increasing our technical guidance and figuring out how to design programs that scale and that aren't just on 10, 20, 40 acres. So that's really where we're moving from. And I think a great way of doing this is we will have this better data for you. This rangeland production statistics will finally look like the rest of agriculture. So we will give it to you for the state like I showed you, but we can show you every single county in South Dakota. And I can show you this, this is what I'm concerned about. If we start seeing this drop in yield, that's called yield gap. All of agriculture does things to try and prevent yield gap. We have to start doing the same thing in rangelands. So we wanna avoid when this bottom trend starts to happen. Uh, even though this isn't a lot yet, right? It's gonna keep going down. So how do we actually scale it up? That becomes the issue. We will have this for you for every county to empower you all to be able to get this message out. And it's proven, this is how we win. We don't chase the problem by chasing and working in large areas and then chasing that tree encroachment and the leading edge of the seed source into our best grasslands. We anchor to intact grasslands, manage the seed contamination, and then work into these bigger areas. It works, landowner groups that are doing that are reducing risk and vulnerability and they're winning. And what's nice about that, it's cheaper and it prevents uh, that land from being taken out of range productivity. It just works better. And we just didn't have the right science guidance 
that didn't trickle through the technical guidance in our programs to help make that happen. We always waited until it became a major problem. And unfortunately, you just can't do that on biome scale threats. So I really feel like what we're doing at this discussion was going from local uh, discussions on this issue, where we're talking about moving from awareness to action. And that's what GPGI, these Great Plains biome frameworks are meant to do. And it's important because we still have some of the most intact grasslands remaining in the world right in our backyard. Uh, we actually have a paper that looks like it's just getting ready to be accepted that shows the importance of the sand hills, uh, the areas of like central and western South Dakota, the Wyoming Basin area. Those are some of our most intact prairies in the entire world, and we haven't told that story. We've been telling the story that in eastern Nebraska, 97 to 99% of that's converted. We forgot to tell the other side. So if we can keep these intact, that's some of our best hopes for large scale grassland conservation this century. And we will be able to measure these outcomes. We have modeled data that is ready to be able to actually measure these metrics and say, how much are we able to prevent loss of rancher income, maintain populations of different wildlife, reduce wildfire danger, prevent these big quarry transitions, but it really depends on us as a group of creating these large scale demonstration sites on private lands. And that's really the discussion I'm hoping to have as this launches uh, in places like South Dakota down to Oklahoma. How can we actually show what success truly looks like? Because right now I only have a couple and I don't have time to show that today, but there's two big success stories so far. And the ranchers in those areas, they wouldn't call it success yet. It just looks better than elsewhere. So thanks for the opportunity to meet on this. Uh, I'll copy this, uh, these links and put them in the chat for you so you can see some of this work and dive into it more. Otherwise, Jeff, thanks so much for having me. All right, thank you, Dr. Tidwell. Really do appreciate your presentation. Um, in the interest of time, I think if we have any questions for Dr. Tidwell, please put them in the chat um, so that we can get along with our agenda. I really do appreciate that information. If you would put those links in the chat, we would appreciate it. Thank you very much. So moving forward on the agenda, uh, we have Colette Kessler. She's going to talk about the next two items, uh, which is conservation innovation grants and the conservation collaboration grant and cooperative agreements. Colette. Good morning. Are you able to hear me OK? Yes. Super. OK, so in the um, handouts with the meeting, if you go to about page eight and nine, I believe that's where there's a summary of the comments that I'll have right here today. So um, the conservation innovation grants are a really cool opportunity for um, for us to try out practices on the landscape. And they've been around for quite a while. And uh, with the um, forthcoming opportunities with climate smart agriculture, there'll be some additional opportunities to test out innovative practices. So I guess part of what I want to do today is just ask our, uh, our ag groups, if you would please, you know, as you're talking with your memberships to um, ask them about practices that they're doing on their landscape that might be outside of what we have in our technical guide, because that's what this conservation innovation grants program is about. So um, there could be something that's that's working out there that we're that we don't have in our portfolio of practices. And uh, anyway, if you um, if, as you get those conversations started, please talk with your local offices or contact me or any of the technical staff, and we'd be happy to uh, start addressing those those new ideas and see how we can get them integrated to our portfolios, our suite of conservation practices. So um, that page has the um, the uh, two proposals that were submitted this year and were selected for funding. We're excited about those. The other page has a summary of our conservation collaboration cooperative agreements and our conservation collaboration grant agreements. So unfortunately this year, um, we uh, had thought we would have more money than we did for agreements, um, but we were able to fund um, 11 agreements. And the summary is on that sheet right there. I won't go through all of them. But um, in the future, you know, please consider ideas for uh, how we might work together for our partnerships for South Dakota and how we can continue to get some um, conservation practices on the land. Uh, it is likely that we'll have um, a call for proposals that will come after the first of the year. And those, that um, call for proposals will be open for 60 days. So uh, everything that we do will be posted on uh, grants.gov so that uh, you can go there and set up your account 
and get um, uh, set your um, notifications for South Dakota. Um, and also we'll do a news release and, and have a distribution announcement too. But I just want to make sure that you're aware of the grants.gov opportunity for notifications as well. So uh, if anybody has any questions, please let me know. Um, you can contact me uh, offline or uh, ask them right now. Thanks. Thanks, Colette. Do we have any questions for Colette regarding our, our grants and agreement opportunities coming up? All right, I'm not seeing any. Thank you very much. All right, next up, the next two agenda items are going to be Jeff Vanderwill and his team um, giving us updates on the conservation implementation strategy and program updates. Yeah. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, so the conservation implementation strategy, just kind of a quick update on where we are with that. Uh, November is typically the month where we make our announcement for new projects for uh, would be 2023 in this case. Um, Going to have a little delay uh, based off of some feedback that we got um, from the uh, sign up we held in 2022 or excuse me 21 for 22. Um, we need to make a few adjustments and uh, I've been working with the leadership team on um, how we're going to make those adjustments and exactly what those adjustments are going to look like. So please bear with us. There'll be a slight delay uh, in us getting those out, but we'll hope to get that out uh, the first part of December. Um, just another quick thing to mention about CIS is that uh, we have funded um, 16 projects each year for the last two years. So we have a total of 32 projects that we have funded so far. Our first 16 um, are up and listed on our website, and we are in the process of getting this next 16, um, getting all the uh, documentation and, and the GIS stuff put together so we can get that on our website so that all 32 projects uh, will be listed on our website and you'll be able to look at those. Uh, I would tell you that as we were, as I've been working on the budget here for 22, uh, we have three projects that uh, were, were able to pretty much use all of their funding last year and therefore um, are now in the phase of waiting to see the results of the uh, hard work that they did on those projects to get practices obligated and now hopefully they're getting implemented. So we hope to see some results from those projects here before too long and we'll have something to be, that we'll be able to share with you guys about the successes that we've had in those areas. So um, that's kind of a quick update on CIS. Uh, we'll be putting that new information out. We're going to basically what we're trying to do is limit the size uh, of the proposals that are being submitted. Uh, we've been getting some pretty large 50 to 100 page proposals submitted, uh, which is not quite what we're after. Um, kind of a lot of extra uh, information is being put into those proposals and we don't want um, them to be quite that elaborate or that difficult. So we'll be working on that and getting some of those sideboards put out so that you guys know kind of what we're after. So look for that and uh, we'll let you know as soon as we've got it ready. We'll get it sent out to the entire state tech list so that you guys are well aware that uh, it's out and on the street and hopefully you can get your proposals put together and we can get a chance to uh, to work together, partner together to do some great conservation work here in South Dakota. So, um, I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit. Uh, I'm going to cover RCPP instead of Gen Wirtz, uh, and then I'll turn it over to Gen Wirtz after I talk about RCPP here as well. Um, again, these are just a couple of quick updates. First and foremost, I would tell you that we anticipate an announcement coming out for new proposals for RCPP. Um, in all honesty, I think headquarters had hoped to have it out by now, um, but they are working on getting the approvals they need from the department to to get that out and on the street. So uh, keep your eyes open for that. Hope to hope it comes out soon, but uh, I don't really have any specifics on when it might be as as they try to work with the department to get the approvals they need to get that announced. Um, I would tell you that we now have a total of nine projects here in South Dakota. 
Um, eight of them are actually uh, administered here out of South Dakota, and then we are a partner state on one project. We did have two new proposals on, under the Alternative uh, Funding Arrangement, or AFA. We had two of those funded recently. One was with the American Coalition for Ethanol, and that is just uh, for South Dakota, kind of the southeast corner of the state, I would say, is their target area uh, where they're going to work on developing some techniques to produce low carbon uh, corn for ethanol, which then hopefully will be able to uh, be used as low carbon fuel uh, in some of the low carbon fuel markets across the uh, country. The other one was with the uh, National Fish and Wildlife uh, Federation. That actually is a five state project that includes us, Colorado, Kansas, Montana, and Nebraska. Now that these are new projects, um, we're trying to get all the uh, agreements and everything all get into place and then make some announcements. But um, the NIFWIF one will uh, be fairly similar to some of the stuff that NIFWIF has done in the past. They're actually going to do sub awards with the funding that they have in order to uh, fund some different projects throughout those five states. So NIFWIF will actually make an announcement for that funding and uh, hopefully be able to get some projects here in South Dakota funded where we can get some conservation on the ground that way as well. Um, the other projects are all in various stages and uh, and I anticipate that most of them will have signups this year in 2022 uh, and hopefully then we can start getting some conservation on ground through our CPP as well here in South Dakota. So. Um, for those of you that don't know, RCPP was kind of revamped in the 2018 Farm Bill. And um, we went from having just about, I think we had three uh, RCPP projects before to now we're up to nine. So uh, RCPP is growing rapidly here in South Dakota, which is pretty exciting. Um, it does require a partnership, uh, which I think speaks speaks volumes of the partnerships that we hear, have here in South Dakota and how we're able to work together to get conservation on the ground. So really excited about that. And uh, like I said, I'll keep letting you know when the new opportunities come around so that if you've got some ideas, we can work together and, and I will. I will honestly help you discuss your projects, what will be a good fit for um, our CPP and what won't. Um, I can't say that I'm batting a thousand, but obviously we're doing fairly well with the number of proposals we submit versus the ones that get funded. So again, continue to try, continue to think about projects, and I'll be happy to work with you on those projects to make sure that we get something that fits pretty well. So that's kind of a quick update on CIS and RCPP both. Uh, so with that, Jackie, I'll turn it back to you. Or uh, excuse me, I apologize. I'll turn it over to Jen to talk about each. Sorry about that. Hey, good morning, everyone. I uh, hope everyone is having a good fall. Uh, I'm going to shut my video off and share a handout of how we wrapped up fiscal year 21. This should be about page 10 of the handouts that were attached to Kathy's invite. Um, this first page kind of breaks down some of the national initiatives that we had uh, with the National Water Quality Initiative, Sage Grouse. Uh, we had Honey Bee Pollinator Initiative. And then statewide, we had the Soil Health Initiative and the Northern Plains Grassland Bird uh, Working Lands for Wildlife um, Initiative. And then we did have some fires up in Perkins County, Jones County. Uh, oh, there was two up in Perkins County and, and one in Jones County that we did some fire recovery for as well. And the, <clears throat> excuse me, the initial allocations and number of assessments that were able to be funded and those are on this page along with kind of just an overall summary of where we sat uh, dollar wise. Uh, and I'm guessing that this handout is a little bit small. But we had about $21 million that we got. Uh, we were able to get 
20 um, million dollar 20.6 million of that obligated into contracts uh, with a total of 355 contracts uh, that we ended up obligating um, when you if you do the math and you add up some of these assessments it's going to be over 355 and the reason being is that uh, with our new ranking system through the conservation assessment and ranking tool uh, cart we can partially fund an assessment through multiple fund pools so these numbers will show that if there's an assessment in another part of the fund pool funded we may result in one contract obligated for that producer though the next couple of handouts and this break down our general funding fund pools, um, the individual reservations, animal waste, beginning farmers, socially disadvantaged, forest, and then we had one fund pool with all 16 categories for our resource units. Uh, and they again break down by where we where we ended up dollar wise in each of them, how many that we funded, how many assessments were totaled in there. Uh, or organic on farm energy, high tunnel wildlife. Uh, we did have SIG and I don't show any of the cost overrun. We did have a little cost overrun monies that went back out um, through some a few modifications. Okay. Um, the next page on that handout covers the 16 CIS projects that we funded last fiscal year and and the results of where we ended up with those. And the, you know, this is showing just the fiscal year 21 part of the budget. Uh, so some of these will also continue into fiscal year 22. So that, uh, and this is a breakdown of the, just the American Indian fund pools uh, that will be used for our tribal advisory committee as well tomorrow. So I, before moving on to anything else, you anybody have any questions? specific to equip from fiscal year 21. OK, uh, just to let you guys know our batching date for basically everything that is on this sheet uh, for fund pools is going to be December 3rd for funding in fiscal year 22. Uh, and right now we had our initial allocation, we're getting about 16.4 million. That is going to be broke out between these fund pools, our 32 CIS projects, uh, and any other um, initiative that comes down the way on that. We have, in addition to that, uh, about 121,000 that will go specifically for the, the National Water Quality Initiative and 400,000 going specifically for sage grouse. I and I know another popular one program that we had or sign up that we had going on in South Dakota was for the honey bee pollinator. Uh, unfortunately, we are not no longer receiving national funding for that, so that honey bee pollinator is going to be kind of wrapped up and incorporated into our wildlife funding pool. So producers still can choose to do honeybee practices, um, providing forage for the honeybees. It'll just be in the wildlife funding pool um, for funding. So um, uh, one other thing that you may have heard is that we have a corona, coronavirus agricultural relief payment as CARP. Uh, those are a payment for the spike or excuse me price spikes that happened in 2021 due to the coronavirus uh, national headquarters issued a um, seven practices that would be mandatory to get these practice or get these price spike uh, payments and then um, there's an additional 18 practices that could be um, used for that and I just say that you know the the practices in South Dakota that we would be looking at are our roofs and covers irrigation pipeline lined waterway or outlet uh, livestock pipeline channel bed stabilization uh, animal mortality facility forage and biomass man uh, biomass planting 
pumping plant, roof runoff structure, livestock shelter structures, uh, saturated buffer, subsurface drain, underground outlet, vegetated treatment area, wetland wildlife habitat, and structures for wildlife. Now, the caveat is that the practice had to be installed in calendar year 21, and it had um, for the top seven that I like named off, those will get a, a percentage uh, payment. The bottom 18 will depend on what the payment rate was for the fiscal year of the contract that that it is installed under. Uh, so there's some that may get a payment, may not. And the total payment going out to the producer needed to be 300, a minimum of $300. So that was just something to make you aware of that we're we're doing that um, as we as we can manage through the the CRP pay, or excuse me CSP payments that are happening right now as well. Um, the payment can be for the CARP can be made into January. So once we get the final numbers of practices installed in calendar year 21, we'll have a more detailed list of what we what we could have done for CARP. So any other questions? Um, I'm going to stop sharing here. I'm the only other thing that I want to add, um, we're going to hold a equip subcommittee meeting here in the near future. I don't know exactly when yet. Uh, my understanding is the um, conservation incentives information is going to be kind of released to us today, shortly after this meeting, actually. Um, at which point then I'll want to convene a subcommittee on how and, and what we're going to target with with this uh, new effort that's going to come. I don't have a lot of details yet, uh, but uh, we'll certainly share those with the subcommittee and then the full committee when we get a chance. Um, at our next meeting. So if you are interested uh, in being part of that equip subcommittee, please let myself or Jen know um, so that we can get you invited to that meeting. Uh, if you. you'd already if you've already signed up for our program subcommittee for state tech, we will invite you as well. Uh, if you have not signed up for that, please let us know. All right, thank you for that. Uh, Joyce, looks like you're up next. Good morning. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, give you the view of what's happening with CSP right now, and be a little bit short this morning, but we're in the middle of our 22 renewal sign up. The um, right application deadline was April 7th, and we received 357 applications for the 2022 renewals. And the allocation we received was 6,628,000. I mean, yeah, $6,628,000. The ranking deadline is actually this Friday, and um, our obligation deadline is December 17th, and these are 2017 classics and renewals, and they have to be obligated before the um, before the end of the year because that before December 31st, excuse me, um, because that that is when they that is their end date. Sorry, my brain some days don't doesn't function right. So this is basically how our allocation was spread out through our resource units, the beginning farmer and the socially disadvantaged to get 10% of our initial allocation. And then the other allocations were spread out according to historical funding levels. We also have a little bit in there for the, the private forest. Sometimes we get an application for those. Sometimes we don't. We'll see what's there this year. The GCI grassland conservation incentive program under CSP that 2022 sign up was. October 15th, the letters were sent out in August. 
from national headquarters and they are currently being worked on that obligation deadline also is december 31st we had a south dakota had an allocation of 83,000 in that and usually that covers whatever applications we do get and then the csp classic 2022 that application deadline is december 3rd along with as jen mentioned that that's also equip and so we're we moved it up this year trying to get things um, completed on time how to give the field offices time to get to the field and get these things reviewed and ranked our initial allocation right now for the csp classic 2022 is eight million six hundred forty thousand we also have an organic allocation of two hundred thousand and the ranking deadline we have placed at March 18th with the obligation deadline of April 29th, 2022. So that's where we sit with CSP class is CSP right now. So if there's any questions, I'll take them. Otherwise, I'll turn it over. All right, thank you, Joyce. Thank you. Let's go on to Brandon. All right. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to share my screen here right away. Uh, well, it's that time of the year when we get to sit down and discuss the easement compensation rates for the year. Um, this is including your packet. Um, some of you might notice a little bit of a change on the map. Uh, this year we are going to be doing things a little bit differently in South Dakota. Uh, we will be conducting individual appraisals on parcels that are tentatively selected for funding. Uh, we did have a few factors that kind of uh, roll into the decision that we made to go this route. Uh, one of the first ones there is we did see a, a reduction in our allocation for easements for this year. Again, uh, we're sitting right about 3.5 million, uh, which is you know quite a bit lower than we've seen in, in previous years. Um, another factor is we actually do have an existing uh, contract in place uh, to conduct these appraisals. And we do already have funding within that contract. So uh, kind of mixing those together, we have some options available to save some funds and move forward with the appraisals. Um, as you can see on the map here, uh, what we're proposing um, is a GARC rate of 90%. Uh, this is the similar rate that we have used um, since 2016. Um, and we have an, a not to exceed rate of 5,800 per acre. Um, a few of the questions that uh, we've received so far from some of the landowners as we've been going through this, uh, the big one is if they as an applicant would have to pay back the appraisal costs. Um, the answer to that is no, um, that is not one of the costs that is associated uh, or charged to landowners should they cancel. Um, it's part of our preliminary due diligence. Um, and the other one that I've had several times already is, you know, if we move to appraisals, do we always have to do appraisals? And the answer to that is no as well. Uh, Jeff and I have discussed several times, you know, we're going to go through the individual appraisals uh, for fiscal year 22, um, and we'll see how it goes, test it out. And if we want to move back to the area wide embark analysis, uh, that is something that we can easily do. Um, I'd say from what I've seen across the, our neighboring state so far, uh, there's some others going this way as well, uh, mainly due to the same reasons uh, with funding and whatnot as well. So I guess if you would have any feedback specifically um, on our GARC rate of the 90% or our not to exceed rate, uh, if you could provide that uh, to Jeff or I by next Friday, uh, November 26th, that'd be greatly appreciated. Um, the next thing that I was going to show you guys is a little bit here on our water bank numbers for fiscal year 21. So this, this year we did have uh, 30 applications for water bank. Um, as you can see down here, we had 20 of them that uh, we were able to select for funding, which covered about 1,832 acres here in South Dakota for just about $877,000. So again, that program is only a total of $4 million for North Dakota, South Dakota, and Minnesota. So we got a, got a pretty nice chunk of it this year. So, 
Um, included in your packet as well is some examples of a WRE and ALE um, ranking. I'm not going to go through those with you folks, but I just wanted to provide those uh, since it's been a little bit of time since we've we've seen those. All of our ranking uh, are posted on our website for WRE and ALE and Water Bank as well. So um, if you ever want to look at all of them, they're on there. And if you have questions on those, I'd definitely be more than happy to answer them when you have a chance to review them. So I guess, Jackie, I'd turn it back over to you unless anyone has any questions for me on uh, GARC rates or easements in general. All right, thank you, Brandon and programs team. Um, any questions for any of the programs team on what they covered today? All right, hearing none, let's move along. Uh, next up, we have Deke Havick with the South Dakota Wetland HEL compliance update. Deke. All right, so I'll start off just going over, you know, last year we did 1,184 certified wetland determinations. It was actually down um, year before we did about 1,500, then we usually average around 1,400. So it is down just a little bit, um, still getting plenty coming in. Um, as you can see, you know, we got 14 on the 569 potential violations includes carryover so we got 14 in progress we did uh completed 17 last year um so we still got some work to do there uh, a lot of those 569s get delayed until after crops are out so we can start doing surveys to determine if there's a violation or not on the site um, so far i mean we're completing about as many as we normally would pace wise uh, we received 44 i would say that we're probably going to get still clear that thousand by the end of the year because it kind of goes in waves harvest gets done people come in um, holidays are over people come in i'm um, trying to figure out make decisions on what they can do what they can get set up uh, the request stage is kind of the nice thing i mean it's fairly stable um, we got a few more that you know bumped into that four month range uh, but for the most part anything six months that's dealing with some obstacle of some sort, um, whether it's uh, having to evaluate different factors for false positives or negatives for a, a variable that's affecting a, a call of hydrology or soils or vegetation. But overall, I mean, we're still sitting almost close to 70% there um, in that three month range. And I'm kind of striving as these requests, you know, few of them come in. I really hope we can get, we're always gonna have something sitting in that six month. I just believe that, but hopefully we can get it down to like 1% would be nice. And then our highly erodible land workload, I mean, that's a fairly significant workload. Um, we, we did 1,878 highly erodible land determinations uh, for participants last year. Um, you know, this year we've completed 20 so far. We got 293 outstanding. Um, and then, you know, sitting here at 168 new breakings last year of that 1800 about half of those were new breakings which is pretty common that's all i really have on compliance as far as numbers and what we usually discuss if there's anything else let me know all right thank you Deke. appreciate that update uh, any questions for compliance All right. Um, so new to the agenda, uh, we decided to add um, some partnership reports, partnership updates, uh, different things that's going on in the in the partnership to update us, uh, give that you a time to get feedback, provide information to us, different things you want to spotlight on that. So we did hear from um, Blaine. Blaine Brecky with the South Dakota Association of Conservation Districts. Uh, he's going to give us a, a short presentation on some locally led success stories. Yes, hello everybody. Um, can everybody hear me? Can you hear me, uh, Jackie? Yep, yep we okay. got you. Perfect. Well, I'll see if I can share my screen quick. There we go. Can you?
Can you see that? Yes, you're good to go. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, um, I'm Blaine Bracke. I work with uh, a grant called a CCD grant called the Locally Led Project um, through SDACD and NRCS. Um, we do all kinds of different work, but mostly centered around locally led and um, resource concerns and working with conservation districts, um, NRCS on a lot of different stuff. Um, one of the a new part of our project that we're starting to work on are these locally led success stories. Um, these would be more centered on video, um, making some videos for promotional work, um, social media ads, stuff like that. Um, and right now we're kind of in the stage of trying to um, identify projects to focus on. So I'm just going to run through a quick few slides on kind of what we're looking for to see if any of you that are on this call have any ideas or projects in mind um, that you would like to be a part of um, this project. So kind of the what is this part of these success stories. So be anything with locally led origins. So, you know, your CIS, RCPP, um, 319 watershed projects, conservation districts, um, you know, game fish and parks, any, any of those kind of partners that involve um, a lot of different groups. Um, so what, what these videos, kind of the vision behind them is the part of the stage that we're in right now. Um, they'll focus on kind of the project as a whole, um, we really want to focus on the people and the partnerships um, that are involved in making, say, like a CIS happen or something along those lines um, happen and just be able to to tell that story that that to people that don't might that might not already know um, how these projects come together and to to be able to showcase what what everybody is doing you know, statewide, all the work that goes into putting a project together um, and the teamwork and partnerships that are made for those to happen. So th that's kind of the big, the big vision of these um, to involve people, um, I guess would be the main, the main goal of it. Um, there'll be a total of eight videos by the time we're said and done, at least that's what we're shooting for, you know, in like a four to eight minute range. Um, just kind of depending on what kind of content we get for them. Um, again, so these would be like local origin. So you would have, you know, everywhere from your community, just community members that are non-producers to producers, um, you know, county um, commissions involved or any other organizations, um, kind of the, the more partners, the better. Um, and that can tie back to say that this was started as a local effort through people coming together um, to want to address an issue. Um, so, and we also need to have identifiable resource concerns. Um, that's another part of the video we'd like to focus on, um, how, how these resource concerns were identified. You know, that wasn't just NRCS or a district saying, um, we need to fix these. It was, you know, producers or community members or, you know, a partner, um, all coming together saying, hey, we have we have a few issues um, and we'd like to address them. So that would be kind of part of the story um, that we'd like to tell. Um, and again, down at the bottom here, the story will be people, relationships, teamwork um, that go into making these projects happen. It'll be a little different from say, uh, soil health videos or grassland videos where they kind of focus on one producer. Um, we'd like to focus on, of course, there'll be producers involved um but it wouldn't be just one so it's just a kind of just a general uh quick and dirty of what these videos are about um if i can go to the next who is going to be involved kind of went over some of that already um community partnership stakeholders project coordinators so not necessarily just nrcs or conservation districts um, it wouldn't even have to be a project that was initiated by NRCS or conservation district. Um, could just be something, um, you know, conservation related. It was started in your, you know, in your county and your district and several counties wide. Um, it's kind of, we're kind of an open book on what we would, what kind of a project we would be willing to take on this. Um, people that would be involved, we would need them 
to be able to participate in interviews about their involvement with the project. Um, so kind of ideally, um, yeah, participants in the project are also willing to speak about it. Um, so there again, producers, NRCS, conservation districts, urban ag, demonstration farms, um, any, any and all um, conservation related. Um, the greater number of partners, the better for this, this project. Um, so when would we be looking to do this? We, we are hoping that this next spring we could start doing some shooting. Um, so that would be with maybe three or four projects starting in the spring of 22, and we can start the others in 2023. Um, you know, some of these maybe they're just, you know, if it's a CIS, it's just getting started in the spring, we could still do some shooting um, and then come back the next year and, and kind of finish it up with with interviews or, or after shots, um, whatever that may be. But we're, we're, we're if, if any of you have any ideas, we can be really flexible on what kind of schedule that we that we go with, depending on everybody else's schedule, since so many ideally so many folks will be involved. Um, so why would we be doing something like this? Um, the big one is just to increase that public awareness and kind of inspire others to get involved. As I became part of this locally led um, project and kind of initiative, we saw, you know, the need that that a lot of people don't know what say NRCS does or conservation districts do or what's happening in, you know, right in their backyard and how these projects come together. They just see things happening, but they don't know how. So that's that's where this came about. Um, you know, social media, commercials, um, education, conferences, you know, in schools, we can for sure show these things kind of anywhere uh, the word would be good to get out. Um, so how are we going to tackle this? So we have Joe Dickey. Some of you might have known him or heard of him. He does grasslands videos, soil health videos, many others. Worked with um, in South Dakota for many years. Um, and he's hired on as our videographer. So he'll be back and forth to South Dakota a lot doing videos for lots of other projects next year. So we'll be real flexible with him. Um, they'll cover large areas, many people. Um, we won't just be able to come out in one day and shoot. But again, like he's he's all over the state. Um, so we can work all that out later if you are interested. Um, kind of the big thing on this, we'll need the teamwork. You know, this this video project would be just as much um, a part of the project that we're featuring um, and the leaders of that project. Um, these videos would kind of just be as much a part of them as say as as my team and the videographer. So we'd need a lot of teamwork both ways to get these to the finish line. Um, and then I guess to finish up, here's my contact info. Um, I'm the locally led project coordinator with SDACD and then Katie Uthi is our communications coordinator. Um, she can also answer any questions. So if you have any ideas, I guess if I can leave you with anything today, just to um, something to chew on if you have a project in your area or something that you've heard about that you think would be a real cool, um, you know, plastered all over the place. Um, but videos to, to showcase and some people involved have some interesting stories. Um, we'd love to hear about them and see if we can work something out. But uh, yeah, that's all I have for you today. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask or, or shoot me an email and we can go from there. But that's all I have, Jackie. All right, thank you, Blaine. Appreciate that. You know, we're we're really great at getting the work done, uh, implementing our projects. We're not great at telling our story. So, really, think this is a great idea, a great project to look for, and getting our message out there to our, our non-traditional customers, those that don't necessarily know who NRCS and the districts are. So, thank you very much for that. Thank you. All right, uh, so we have a few minutes left. So are any other partnership updates that you want to provide? Anything going on in your respective areas uh, that you want want to share? Jackie, can you hear me? This is Sandy Smart. Yes, Sandy. So I just wanted to say hello to everybody. Um, I'm starting my new role as the Ag and Natural Resources Program Leader in, at SDSU Extension. 
And so I'll be uh, trying to attend as many of these kinds of meetings as I can and working, looking forward to work with um, folks um, from NRCS and all over as ways we can um, increase the capacity of conservation in South Dakota. So I just wanted to say hi to everybody and uh, looking forward to meeting people in person as we can. All right, welcome Sandy. Thanks for coming on. All right, do we have any other updates or questions regarding anything we covered today or something we may not have covered? Okay, I'm not seeing any questions or any hand raised, so I think we'll we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Thank you all so much for joining us today. We really do appreciate your your input, your feedback, your participation. Uh, partnerships is what makes us successful, and we've been doing great work here in South Dakota. And I know we can keep it up into the future. If you have any questions throughout, you know, the next quarter, um, we do have our tentative dates scheduled for our next um, state tech meeting, which is February 16th. Uh, so mark that down on your calendar. Uh, we'll move forward with that date unless you know something comes up that we are unable to move forward. But right now, tentatively, uh, save the date is February 16th for our next state technical committee meeting. Again, thank you for joining us. Do appreciate you and thank you for all the work you do for conservation in South Dakota. Have a great afternoon.